Yes. I just have a handful of further questions to ask you. Um, you spoke about the stigma that you were aware of of having uh, of patients having thalassemia. Mm. Um, mm. Are you aware of any work that the hospital's done, perhaps with the Thalassemia Society, in terms of outreach to particular communities to seek to lessen that stigma? Um, many years ago, the UKTS ran a, an Asian awareness um, group, and this this was mainly about. Um, getting young people to be aware of thalassemia so we could, you could get in screening and, you know, testing before perhaps you, you, you met your life partner. Um, but obviously on the back end of that, that actually brought a lot of awareness to the population, what thalassemia was. Many thalassemia patients would go and talk to these communities along with the UK Thalassemia Society about what thalassemia was. And thalassemia is improving all the time. Patients are living hopefully nor normal lives now. So it, that was a huge sort of boost. Um, it, as I say, this is, it, it still hasn't cracked all communities, but it did have a, a quite a major breakthrough in, in this population. And you discuss in your statement uh, your own presentations that you've given at Thalassemia Society conferences. Um, can you recall ever um, discussing the risks of transfusion transmitted infection or perhaps the signs or, and symptoms to look out for? It, to consider if someone ha um, has been infected. Was that something that was done with not, the society? Not specifically, be um, as in, because by that stage, um, by the time I was in the post, the blood was it is safe and patients are screened or should be screened annually anyway and vaccinated appropriately. Um, I think uh, a lot of the talks I gave, so if you, if you went to maybe a small centre somewhere in the north of England where you, you're talking to the nurses or the doctors there, we go through the whole sort of remit of thalassemia so again a sort of virus screening liver screening all of that would come into it so and I will have obviously presented quite a few days about our hepatitis C patients but it wouldn't have been specifically about what to, to to look out for but really the screening that those medical professions should be doing anyway for their patients and when you started um, work as a, a specialist nurse in, in thalassemia, were there any uh, leaflets available about hepatitis C or any information, written information available? Um, no. They, they, when it came to the treatments, there were, uh, I think we did our own hospital sort of basic patient information leaflet about side effects and management of side effects. Uh, the drug companies also had provided information about the, the treatment. But I don't think there was specifically one about hepatitis C itself. It would be more about the treatments. And you spoke about one patient who, uh, one thalassemia patient who had required a liver transplant. Is, is that proportion reflective of the proportion of thalassemia patients who require liver transplants in any event? Or was it something No. Uh, we've never had a patient requiring a liver transplant for iron overload alone. Um, even, I mean, the... the the one good thing about um, liver iron, if you like, if you intensively collate, you can remove um, liver iron quite quickly. You can, to a certain extent, slightly improve the scarring, provided they haven't got so far down the road. So this is what we're constantly telling our younger patients, please don't get into that, that area. But in our experience with the liver iron, um, if you have had previous liver iron and you have got a scarred liver, you get rid of the liver iron, you will not miraculously remove the scarring you may slightly ameliorate it but you will stop it progressing but unfortunately when you put the virus in with that and when you I looked at the data actually on on the slides of this one particular patient who had um, the liver transplant his liver iron actually was very low so it didn't take much for, for with the virus to, to attack his liver um, and you've mentioned a multidisciplinary team approach to care and treatment at various points in your evidence from, a, from your perspective as a clinical nurse specialist, what are the benefits of that sort of team working? Uh, tremendous benefits. I mean, we're trying to grab any team that will, will come on board. So obviously, psychological support is, is vital for, for these patients. Um, we have cardiology, um, a joint uh, clinics with the cardiologist, uh, which is extremely important for the heart problems. We now have uh, a guy uh, with a, a liver expert at the Whittington who's taken a great interest and he's doing joint clinics at UCLH and soon to do them at the Whittington. So we can monitor not just the, the hep C, but also the general liver patients. We have an endocrine joint uh, clinic, so looking growth development, uh, pituitary issues, fertility issues. 
We have a diabetes joint clinic for those who've developed diabetes. We have two excellent obstetricians who've actually come on board with us. So it's a massive thing. It really is looking after the patient from, from head to toe and in the best possible care. And finally, in your role as a, a hepatitis C clinical nurse specialist, what's your view of the need for hepatitis C screening more generally? Well, I think nowadays, it, even more so than ever, because we have these treatments now. I know from our patients that went through it compared to the previous treatments, they said it was a walk in the park, it's three months, they all, you know, were cured. Personally, I would say, you know, anybody who could get tested, get tested. The treatment is now available. It is very tolerable and you know looking at the, the prevention of long-term problems it, it's vital I'm just going to check behind me sir uh, they are all the questions that I've been asked to raise sir do you have any further questions uh, no I don't thank you very much Ms Prescott is there anything else you would like to add to your evidence um, no the only thing I really would like to get out on behalf of the patients is really the, you know how it did impact on their lives they have had such terrible tough time in their youth before treatments changed and I think then this on top of it really has significantly impacted on their life and just talking to one of the patients only yesterday he you know he really that's the bit of his his thalassemia that that sticks out the most so I think you know I'm very glad that people are sort of taking so much sort of heed to this well it, it certainly has been very important to us um, as the evidence today would have shown, uh, that we looked at both yes. sickle cell in, in, in particular in the morning uh, and thalassemia in particular in the, the afternoon. Um, and you've been thoroughly illuminating in that, uh, and I wanted to thank you for that and for your support of the, uh, of the patients in the ways that you have. Um, if I can just comment, uh, since uh, I'm talking and for those who, who are listening, uh, earlier on uh, today, I, I repeated uh, the plea that I, I made earlier um, for those who have uh, hepatitis C, or for that matter, HIV infections, but who also suffer uh, from thalassemia or, or from sickle cell, uh, to, if they can, come forward. Uh, what I didn't say, of course, in, in, uh, in the short um, mention which I made this morning, uh, was that if they are worried about giving evidence, because one of the matters you raised was yeah. people are worried about putting their head above the parapet. Mm -hmm. they've, they've suffered so much stigma, they, they cannot bring themselves to identify uh, as someone. That well, state, which statements are in writing, that's evidence to the inquiry, and they can be anonymous. Uh, if someone doesn't want to go even that far, uh, there are people I've mentioned intermediaries this morning uh, somebody suggested that I might want to say what intermediaries are they are people trained social workers who work for the inquiry who will come on an entirely confidential basis and pick up what someone has to say uh, and relay it in, in a report in due course to the inquiry without mentioning any names and so there'll be nothing to identify uh, anyone who, who does that but the essence of what people have to say if they want to contribute will be there. Now, they don't have to contribute. I want to thank you for encouraging people to do so. Uh, but uh, as you said, some have very good reasons. Uh, they don't want to be reminded of, of what happened. Uh, they may have other very good reasons for, for not wishing to. They don't have to have a reason not yeah. to. Uh, they have to want to, to give a, a statement. But I want to make it absolutely clear that as far as we are concerned, uh, we will treat any offering which they have with the respect which it deserves. Um, but uh, thank you for your part in that uh, and for coming today uh, to talk to us. Uh, thank you very much. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, so in the morning, we will be hearing from the Palliative Care and Advanced Liver Disease Expert Group. Uh, that's Dr. Hazel Woodland, Dr. Ben Hudson, and Dr. Fiona Finlay. And then in the afternoon, we'll be hearing from Ms. Samantha May um, from the Hepatitis C Trust. So tomorrow, 10 o'clock.